We're so grateful, Father, for the Holy Spirit that teaches us and directs us for me, this teaching, and, for, and also for the learning also. We depend upon you, and we thank you, Lord. We commit our night unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever considered the first 11 chapters of the Bible covers 2,000 years? The next 39 chapters of Genesis covers four year, uh, 40, uh, 400 years. How many was the first? 2,000 years. 2000. What does that say to you? Huh? Leave out the details. Yeah. Could you imagine if God went into the details that he did, he does in the next 39 chapters, in the first 11 chapters, how, how long the Bible would be? <laughs> so what, what actually is it telling us that uh, it's just stepping stones, just bare necessities taking us through the first 2,000 years until Abraham. Until the setting up of his people. Stepping stone. And if we didn't have the rest of the Bible to shine back on that, we'd know nothing about it. It wouldn't tell us anything. We, yes? That puts light on all, if everything was written, the, the world could not, could not contain it. That's right. Yeah, really. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> that was in John 21. Yes. Yeah. Thinking about that. Yeah. So when people say, oh, where, did, where did Cain and Abel get their, their, their wives from? Oh, they think they've stumped you there, you know. Natural man. Huh? The natural man. Huh? Well, you know, it was 135 years till uh, Adam and Eve had another son, Seth. That's what the Word of God tells us. Right? 135 years later, she had a son to replace the one that was lost, Abel. Right? That's what Scripture says. And after that, what? lived for another 600 years and had sons and daughters. But how many daughters did she have before between Cain and Seth? It doesn't mention that, does it? It's left up to your thinking. Right? It's left up to your thinking. So basically, the Bible only goes through the man, the male. Follows genealogies through the male normally, but it she does say, it does say that and she had sons and daughters, leaving us to understand that she could have had thirty daughters that hundred and thirty years, because Cain and Abel had uh, wives, and so did Seth. It says Seth had a wife, and they bore children. But they think, people think they've stumped you and say, well, where did Cain and Abel get their wives from? No, the scriptures don't teach everything. The gifts just give you step, just the main things of every aspect up to the time of Noah, the first 2,000 years. No details given, but the Lord would shine light upon it as the need was brought forth. But Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve had to go by faith somehow. It doesn't tell them, it tell us how much God revealed of himself to Adam and Eve. But they had good fellowship before the, uh, the, the sin broke it. So they must have a pretty good relationship there. Stepping stones. You see, the fall of man, of many aspect, sin brought into the world. And then we see before 
They leave the garden. What did he do? What does God do to them, Adam and Eve before they leave the garden? Clothe them, right? It doesn't go into detail. The fig leaves weren't enough, were they? They'd probably fall off. I don't know. I don't know why. But the fig leaves were not enough. It doesn't say he killed a lamb or anything else or the shedding of blood or anything else, but put skins on them. Leaving you to understand later as you see the light that there had to be bloodshed for the skins to be put on them. A first sacrifice. He doesn't explain it in the scriptures. But I believe possibly uh, Adam and Eve knew about it <laughs> as they went out because they'd have hope. And then we go a little further. We go a little further and we, uh, we run into the first murder, don't we? Cain slew Abel. Two of them had sacrifices, right? One might say possibly the Cain sacrifice was far more expensive and more of a sacrifice probably than Abel's. Abel, all Abel had to do was let the thing grow on its own. The lamb. Cain had to put wear and tear, he had to put seed, he had to cultivate it, he had to work and everything else, and he got this tremendous sacrifice for God, and they offered it to him. It doesn't say why God didn't like his sacrifice. All it says is Cain got mad, and rightly so, because he didn't understand. Look at what I gave you. I gave it in good hope. I gave it to worship you. And you rejected it. I, Abel gave his lamb. And it was accepted. He was praised. What's going on here? No, it doesn't explain it, does it? It doesn't explain it. But later on, the scripture shines light back onto it again. Without the shedding of blood, there's what? No remission of sin. He thought he was doing a good job. So we have here introduced to us two religions, right at the very beginning. Faith and works. Huh? Faith and works. Yeah, grace and works. Yeah. Grace and works. And and it's still with us today. The biggest part of so-called Christendom believes that they're going to get there because they're good people. Because they go to church. And some of them do a better job of going to church than many Christians do. And you look at them, they're so dedicated. Some will go every single morning to to the church to pray in that church. But we have a verse of scripture, don't we? Somewhere in Matthew chapter 20, uh, chapter... (laughs) Matthew chapter 7. (laughs) Matthew chapter 7. Well, let's turn to it. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. I, I claim this to be one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible. You'll understand it right away. Verse 22. Oh, let's go to verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. For he that doth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, here we go. Many will say to me in that day, what day? The day of judgment. Lord, Lord, they're calling him Lord. Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name the many wonderful, dreadful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work. What? Iniquity. I think that's one of the saddest passages of Scripture in the Bible. All these well-meaning people Giving, a li- giving their money, giving a lifetime to, 
worshiping a God, but in the wrong way. And I started in Cain and Abel. Start right there. He didn't know where he was starting, did he? And we see it going right through time. I was speaking, I had my friend come over here, my school friend, he came over with us a couple of times. He sat in the services, had devotions every morning when we had our devotions every morning. In fact, one morning I, I was a little late getting to it and he said, hey, we haven't had our devotions yet. And we had our devotions. And I challenged him on it at one time again, after going through all this. Oh, he said, I'm not going to make it there. He said, I'm not good enough. But Sylvia will. She's good. That's his wife. He was a Catholic and he turned Protestant to marry Sylvia. And Sylvia is an Anglican that never missed church. And he started going and he never missed church with her. They walked to church about two miles every single Sunday for the sacrament only. They had the sacrament and they went home. No message or anything else, but they had the sacrament. Something went wrong in the church and uh, somebody complained about the pastor and they loved the pastor, so they left the church and they never went back to the church again. For years later, to years later. In fact, they never went back. In fact, she hasn't gone back to this day. If she's still alive, he's gone now, without the Lord. And then she lost a granddaughter. And then now she's lost a daughter. And there's just two daughters left now and a, and a son-in-law. And they still don't know the Lord. And I've prayed every single day for them since I've been saved. Should I quit? No. no. But she's not going to get there on her good works. And she's a good person. And I tell you, my buddy, Ray, I never heard him swear once in his life. And I knew him way before I got saved. I've never seen him do a wrong thing. He didn't drink. He never had anything but a smile on his face, did he, Beth? The most lovable person you could ever wish to meet. Doesn't make sense, does it? Why he should go. And there's some real cranky Christians that are going to make it. <laughs> yeah. But we cannot reason. But deep down in our side, we still got that work set up in our heads. But they're good people. We've got to get it out of our heads. <laughs> Goodness isn't going to get us there. It's the blood. The shed blood. So we see this taking place. One accepted, one rejected. No explanation. But time will tend, tell. One, one way the, the way of works opens up into that wide road, doesn't it? Many denominations, all different aspects. What do you think of this prayer day in Washington, D.C. that the Graham is producing right now? Good thing. Huh? Good thing. It's a good thing? Good thing. They're inviting everybody Everybody to come to that prayer meeting. People like Graham. They know that you, 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 can't be say, you can't approach God except you be born again. But he's call, asking everybody to come to Washington. Is that right? It sounds right. It sounds good. What, what could be wrong with everybody praying? Well, are you deceiving people that when you know that their prayers aren't going to be heard? Huh? Confusion. Yeah. Things that seem right, seem logical to us, are they right with Scripture? The Scripture tells us we are dead in trespass and sin. We have no communication with God. 
And we're, if we're telling all these people to come and pray, we're saying, God will hear you. Either that or we're deceiving them. Aren't we? Doesn't that sound cruel? Huh? Am I wrong? Huh? Pardon? It's for the believers. Oh, yeah. But do we have to go there to do it? No. Now, if we gathered, say we, say, say we had a week of prayer at the church, and everybody came down here, and we prayed for, for maybe an hour every day of the week or something like that, that would be great. Because we're all believers. Or we could just challenge you, hey, which we don't need to challenge you because you're doing it already, I hope. <laughs> we have to tell him to give a sermon before the prayer starts and give them the way of salvation. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe some would be saved. He does, play, he does share salvation very lightly, not very deeply. I've never heard him mention the blood much. But uh, he does say that people need to be, uh, get saved, but he doesn't explain what saving means. And to say that, it, we have to go by the word of God. You can't gently challenge people sometimes when they're sinners. You've got to point them to sin. From the scriptures. So get to know the scripture so we have an answer. That is important, isn't it? Well, let's see where are we. For 2,000 years, we have the principle of atonement. From Genesis 3, 15, the bruising of his heels, Right? to the clothing of Adam and Eve, to the two offerings. One was of blood and one wasn't. One was acceptable, one wasn't. Here's the principle of the atonement. Here's the principle of the Redeemer. It's starting right from the very, but just stepping stones are not explained to us. But it had to be explained to them. Otherwise, um, Cain wouldn't have had any reason to be angry. He had to be disobedient. But he figured he, he could do his thing, own thing. And how many of pe the people claiming to be Christian believe they can do their own thing? Huh? Oh, but God's got to accept it. Why? Because I say it. But who are you compared to God? Sometimes we can get so personal with God, we bring him down to our level and forget where he is. The almighty God. The all-powerful God. We get him down to a buddy, a Santa Claus. And we lose, we lose the, the respect for the living God. So we have then the line of purity coming out of belief, as we get into chapter 5 of Genesis, we get the genealogy from Noah on back. Right on back, we can go back and we see that uh, Noah's great-grandfather was Enoch. And he walked with God and was not. Right? And then there was Methuselah. The oldest man of the Bible, right? Lamech. And then comes Noah. All men that walked with God. Spanning over a long time. Actually, Methuselah links Adam with Noah. Through the 2,000 years. So there's a link from Noah right to Adam. With Methuselah. And Methuselah was alive while Noah was alive. Interesting, isn't it? And through that time, 
there was a, a thin blood line going right across. But it tells us, where was it? It tells us, uh, right after, I think it was chapter 4, 30, 36. Let's go back to Genesis 4, 36. Uh, 26, is it? Yes. And Seth to, uh, and to Seth, to him also, there was born of a son. And he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. That's what I'm getting at. 135 years after Adam and uh, after Cain and Abel, then they started calling on the name. What, what went on for that 135 years between Seth and Cain and Abel? They weren't talk, uh, calling on the name of the Lord, were they? Then they started calling on the name of the Lord. And then the line starts to go clearer up to Noah, up to the time of Noah. But all of these things wouldn't have meant anything if the Lord hadn't guided and directed the light to shine, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ to shine through the scriptures, bringing out these things at a later date. They wouldn't have meant nothing on their own. God's way a man's way. The bloodline marks the way, but not explained, just shown. Good works, costly gifts, truly sacrificial giving came with angry. God was grieved. Let's just look in closing at Hebrews chapter 11. Looking at verse 4. By faith Abraham, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gift, and by it he began he being dead, yet speaketh. And then we go on a little further. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Now we're getting the light shining right back on those scriptures here, kind of challenging us as to what was going on there. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased to God. Here's that thin red line coming through. By faith, verse 6, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And he goes on to say, by faith, Noah, and so forth, built the ark. The whole thing was faith in what we don't understand. Trusting God. And without it, we can't please God. Doesn't mean to say we can't get saved, but we're not living by faith. As long as you have the act of faith to receive him as your savior. Uh, so some Christians, that's as far as their faith goes. Then they start working by human nature, by reasoning, and they live their lives accordingly. And they don't seem to be much different to the world. In fact, sometimes the world's a lot better than them. We are saved by faith, and we live by faith. And this is our road book, our road book guideline, isn't it? I'm sure glad one years back there. I was wondering what I could do to please God. I'd only got saved a little while. I said, I should get missionaries. I said, but I didn't know much about missionaries or anything else. I said, how could God use a paper hanger in Africa? You can't paper hang where, 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 
shacks and wood huts. How can... And then I went to Word of Life. Jack Workson challenged me there. So I went forward and I said, I'd like to work for you. I'd like to serve God by working for you. I'll, I'll be a gardener. I hate gardening. <laughs> but I detest it. I'll be a gardener. He said, gardeners have to go to Bible college here. Oh, that puts me out. I'm not going back to school. I left school when I was 13 years old. I'm not going to go back there. No way. That puts me out of serving God. Oh, what am I going to do? God didn't leave me alone. Correspondence courses. So I did about three or four correspondence courses with Modi. And I got good marks. That wasn't going to be enough. God wouldn't allow me on it. I said, Lord, I think you're telling me something else. I said, if you want me to go to school, and you know I'm not a high school graduate, you want me to go to school, take all my work away from me. And I was booked up pretty solid with my paper hanging. Oh, about three or four months went by. I'd forgotten even I prayed about it. But I ran out of work. I couldn't understand it. I got no more work. The work was coming in one job at a time, and I'd go the next day and do it. I didn't have a backlog. I couldn't. And then, boom, it hit me like this. What did you pray? Take more? Yeah, I've, I've just done that. I said, well, now you have to go to a little step, a step further, Lord. I'm going to apply to school. And I'm not going to have bet check over my spelling mistakes. <laughs> I'm going to send it in this raw. And they're not going to want me. No, no way. They're not going to want me. Left school at 13 years old. This that I've got, I sent it to them. I didn't get an answer back from them. I said, ah, fine. I told the pastor, he said, well, they would answer it back one way or the other. They wouldn't just leave you high and dry. So he called them up, the school up. They must have got lost. They'd accepted me. <laughs> On the ground that I'd been in business myself for 12 years, and if I could run a business, I, I could be dealt with, I could learn, learn. So they accepted me. I had to be in school in August, and this was July the, the fourth weekend, wasn't it, Beth? July... Oh, I put the house on for sale. Nobody's going to bother me on the July 4th weekend. That Saturday, they came around, they bought the house. One day after I put it up for sale. In August, I was in Bible college, scratching my head, wondering what I was doing there. He, he works in wonderful ways. He's just so marvelous when you commit everything to him. You don't have to understand it. It doesn't have to be spelled out to you. But just don't jump. Check Scripture with Scripture. Let the Word shine upon it. See what he's getting. Understand it, and then take it by faith. And God bless us. And that's what this church needs. Especially if we're going in for a new pastor. Pray to the Lord. Be right before the Lord, serving him. And if he says no, accept it. And when he opens the door and shows you what he will do eventually, praise God for it. I've had 18 months, um, interim work. I've had two churches, 18 months interim work. I had a two and a half year interim work and two three year interim works. All five of them eventually got the, the, the pastor and they're all there still. Some have been there now for 18 years. It's just the one, the Florence fell apart. And I didn't help, help with that one. I got sick and I had to leave. And they went out then, they didn't check it out properly. And the church fell apart. You have to be careful. You do it right. Wait upon the Lord. Know what you're looking for. What type of a ministry you're looking for. And God will bless. 
Well, that's all I got for you for tonight. That's all I got. Ain't no more. We'll get around Noah tomorrow, uh, next week, Lord willing. We'll see what Noah, Noah's got to say. Pretty close.